Twitter I mean, it can be a rough place as well. Our own uh, Kenny Rosenthal found that out uh, just a couple days ago here. Actually, here just uh, this morning here, Kenny sent out a tweet, came back from vacation to everyone asking. Yes, I've been on vacation. I'm back now. And Jeremy Guthrie, ouch. Thanks, Ken. Oh, ow. I'll tell the other two guys. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> Got to have thick skin. Uh, Ken Rosenthal lead the league with the information here. Uh, to roll on Twitter, huh? What's up with Jeremy Guthrie taking a shot? Fran, I just wish Jeremy would have had his facts straight. It was actually six guys that had <laughs> <Yeah. to> me. <laughs> Actually, there were a number of people who were asking. I was away for a week, and people were starting to get concerned in a sense that they thought maybe something was wrong with me beyond something that usually might be wrong with me. <laughs> so I just sent that tweet out, and of course I expected some blowback. Didn't ex necessarily expect it from Guthrie, but that's all good. All right, but he came back though, right? Took well, and here's the thing. You know what? I do something I thought was nice for Jeremy Guthrie during the World Series and then to take the heat, but no, he came back with this. And those are his sons. Wow. And I met them at the World Series. Great kids, look at them. <laughs> Beautiful children. And Jeremy's one of the great people in the game as well. He all in good fun. God forbid you stay off Twitter for a week. <laughs> Otherwise, the world is coming to an end. But, uh, Kenny, let's get to really the hottest story in baseball this offseason. It has been the San Diego Padres and, of course, the latest move, A.J. Preller and company signing James Shields to the four-year deal for $75 million, including uh, the buyout here. But you got a great uh, column on FoxSports.com that, that basically – uh, Preller and company, they might not be done, and they have some other things to potentially worry about here. Well, they do, and what's interesting to me about the Padres is that for all they've done, and I love what they've done, make no mistake about it, they are still a team that has some flaws. Now, all teams have flaws, we know that, but when you look at the Padres, you look at the outfield defense, shaky. The infield overall, not to the quality that you would want for a championship caliber club, the starting rotation beyond Shields is fragile. They're awfully right-handed in their lineup and in their rotation. So you can see scenarios in which things might not go as well as you would expect. Now, they're a much more relevant team, a much more interesting team. That is not in dispute. And I've written before that what they have done has shamed other clubs in either better revenue positions or comparable ones that sit around and don't do nearly as much. But that said, the question then becomes, if you're A.J. Preller, what happens if this doesn't work? Does he just sit there and let it all play out? Or does he admit his mistakes and act quickly to fix them? They've got some potential free agents. Ian Kennedy, Joaquin Benoit, and of course Justin Upton. So they could make some moves to get out of some things in July if necessary. They don't expect to have to do that. They don't want to have to do that. But I was really struck by something Billy Bean said at his team's Fan Fest over the weekend. And Billy Beam, in a Q&A session with fans, basically said, hey, if these don't work, these moves, if one of them doesn't work, we'll do something else. That's how we do things here in Oakland. We're not going to wait around. Well, what I wrote was that A.J. Preller can't wait around either. If this doesn't work, the answer is not to fire the manager, Bud Black, who is someone that A.J. Preller inherited. No, the answer would be to retool on the fly, as Oakland has done so many times over the years. Keep in mind one other thing, guys. To this point, A.J. Preller has traded prospects that he did not develop. They were not his guys. And he has signed players at depressed prices or acquired them at depressed prices because they've got some warts on them. Matt Kemp, James Shields, etc. So the real test comes when he has to admit his own mistakes. And let's hope for the Padres' sake that doesn't happen, but chances are that he might be in such a position. You know, Kenny, I think that's the hardest thing uh, with the team, the, the symbiotic relationship of having the players, the coaching staff, and the front office, is that the front office has, can't always blame it on just the manager or the players. Sometimes the moves that are made six months prior just don't work out. Right, and Ron, I'd like to get your opinion on this. When these teams do this kind of thing, these extreme makeovers, we saw it with the Marlins a couple of years ago, the Blue Jays, when they basically shift the whole club it's not necessarily right away that that team comes together. It sometimes takes a little bit, and I know there are people in this building named Brian <laughs> Kenny who dismiss the notion of team chemistry, but Ron, what is yeah. that like when you have 
<laughs> essentially new club coming to spring training. You know, Kenny, I think it's a lot different than it's been in the past because te guys change teams so often now. So I think you're more used to it now. I think, though, when you have that kind of change, that many players coming into the clubhouse, I think it might work to your advantage. You know what I'm saying? As opposed to having two or three new guys coming in. This honestly has taken this entire roster and turned it upside down, shook it, and whatever fell out, they put new parts in. And uh, maybe having so many new guys coming to the ball club might be a nice fit for this Padres who uh, went through, Kenny, one of uh, historically uh, tough offensive years last year. No doubt. And they are going to be a much more interesting offensive team. And that is really the hallmark of what Preller has done. He's energized a dormant franchise. He's taken a team that, as you said, was one of the worst offensive teams in baseball last year and suddenly made it into something of a threat. There is a legitimate conversation going on right now in the baseball world about whether the Padres are good enough to overtake the Dodgers and or the Giants. Now, most projection systems say no, but at the same time, you know how this game works now. You get to 85 wins, maybe you get to 88, maybe you get a wild card, and then maybe you get on a roll and win the World Series. So they can dream there, and it's a great thing for the Padres to be in that spot. All I'm saying in that column, again, is that if the alternative occurs, and if they don't have the season that they anticipate, they've got to be prepared to move on quickly from some of the things they've done. Well, let me jump back to Shields for a minute, and easy for me to say, but why only four years, 75 million for Shields when we were hearing 100, 110, and, and were those offers real? I mean, were there teams that really made those offers? Was that just smoke? Give us a skinny. Fran, certainly a fair question. And I was the one who reported in early January that two executives said it was their understanding that he had a five-year, $110 million offer in hand and that he was expecting, or that the industry actually was expecting him to get at least five years, $100 million. Now, obviously that did not happen. So what went wrong? Well, a couple of possibilities. One, Perhaps the agent just simply aimed too high. The agent is Paige Odell. He is not as high profile as some others. Perhaps Shields never got that offer or got that offer and didn't want to go to the team that made it to him. That's also possible. But in the end, he ended up in a place where he wants to be. He ended up with money that is not quite where he wanted it to be, but at the same time is certainly, as you said, not bad money. My objection here is that early on in the process when the Giants were interested reportedly at a four-year 80 million dollar level why not get that to say four years 85 four years 90 push it up and just be done with it and go from there rather than have this whole thing linger the entire offseason and essentially they got an outcome that was better than they probably deserved for the first week of February so it ends up okay but the negotiation in the eyes of many was not handled that well Kenny, the consensus of most of the analysis here is that the Cubs are probably a year or two away from challenging, but uh, it seemed like they had some interest in Shields late. What does that say about the Cubs right now and how they feel about themselves? Well, they did have interest late, Ron, and I was interested in that. I was fascinated. Why the Cubs, here's a team that already has spent on Lester, seemingly is preparing to spend on next year's big free agent class, Price, Zimmerman, Cueto, Granke, Fister, Porcello, that whole group. Why would they go after James Shields? Well, the answer was because he lingered on the market, and what they tried to do was slip in with a three-year deal. Now, that kind of contract, had Shields accepted it, might have precluded them from going out and getting one of the bigger free agents next offseason, but the way the Cubs saw it, they wanted a three-year deal. They like a, the idea of a three-year deal for a pitcher of the quality of James Shields because it kind of lines up with where they are. In three years, when that deal would have expired, they'll have their younger players starting to become eligible for arbitration, the Chris Bryants, the Solaires of the world, and then Shields would go away, the money would go away. A six-year deal, another six-year deal after Leicester, which is what they'll be facing next offseason with the top of that group, Cueto, etc. The Cubs aren't a team like most teams that like that kind of thing. They consider it to be a high risk. So. The idea was get Shields on the short term, have it expire in a good time in their payrolls evolution and go from there. It didn't happen, and now the Cubs will pursue perhaps another way to improve their pitching staff, their starting rotation, and that would be through a trade. Remember, this team has some of the top hitting prospects in the game. They can make a trade 
with one of those players, or more for that matter, for a young pitcher, young starting pitcher, in that same comparable service class. So they have still a number of options, and they still could play on one of the big guys next offseason. It's just not their preference, and the Shields' pursuit indicated, again, that their appetite for six-year deals is not what it, you would want it to be if you're one of those pitchers. And that's why Cole Hamels is so intriguing, because four years, 90 mil, teams, not only the Cubs, but there are other teams, obviously, that would look at that deal, I would think, and say that that deal is, is one that they can absorb and not be too exorbitant. All right, so, well, Kenny Rosenthal, Twitter Nation, he is back from vacation, <laughs> and he's back on Hot Stove.